All right, why don't we get started? Um, I will uh, provide a little bit of introduction. So, um, well, a few more people enter the room, but uh, we'll say good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Wood Harvesting and Storage, uh, Wood Vault, a low cost and easily scalable way to remove atmospheric carbon dioxide to fight climate change. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by the USDA Northeast Climate Hub. Our speaker today is Dr. Ning Zeng of the University of Maryland, who has been researching and developing the idea of wood vaults for over 15 years. He's further refined this idea in a publication that came out just about a year ago now in the journal uh, Carbon Management, and we'll put a, a link to this paper in the chat later on. I'm Dave Hollinger, former director of the Northeast Climate Hub. For those of you new to the climate hubs, they were set up by the Department of Agriculture to provide information and assistance to agricultural producers and forest land managers on adapting to and also mitigating uh, a change in climate. There are 10 hubs across the country with the Northeast Hub covering the states uh, ranging from Maine in the north to West Virginia in the south. The Northeast Hub is led by Dr. Lindsay Rustad of the U.S. Forest Service Northern Research Station, uh, along with a team representing the Agricultural Research Service, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, the National Agroforestry Center, and various other hangers-on. Uh, also, a special shout out to Aaron Lane, the Hub Coordinator, and Karen Kwasnick, the Hub Digital Content Manager, as well as Sarah Kellman, who are uh, you know, operating in the background today, making sure that uh, everything goes smoothly. Uh, for more information about the hub, I urge you to either visit the uh, Climate Hub's website or to contact a member of, of the Northeast team or a, a team in your area for more information. Uh, in terms of today's webinar, uh, I came across Dr. Zeng last summer after I was involved in helping to organize a workshop on nature-based climate solutions. Uh, the idea behind nature-based solution, solutions is to, use existing, is to use the existing carbon uptake and storage capabilities of forests or agricultural systems or other natural ecosystems to increase the removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and then to store that carbon that's been removed for very long periods. For these sort of nature-based solutions to be useful, they must first of all provide additional storage to what's otherwise happening. Uh, they also need to store the carbon for as long as possible. And, they, and this, the solutions need to be as low risk as possible, uh, just to make sure that the carbon that's been removed from the atmosphere has no chance of, of returning and escape, escaping and returning to the atmosphere. Uh, there are a number of, of nature-based solutions that have been um, sort of um, postulated and, and are underway. Uh, a review by um, Kim Novak and others sort of looks at, at these uh, uh, recently. However, in many cases, the carbon you know, is stored in the ecosystem. And so the risk of it uh, returning to the atmosphere is non-trivial. Uh, Ning's wood vault idea addresses all of these concerns with a sort of hybrid approach between the nature-based side and an engineering solution. I'm personally so excited about the wood vault concept that I'm carrying on working with Dr. Zeng and spreading the word about wood vaults, uh, even though I'm, I'm retired now. Um, before we start, a reminder, uh, you can put your questions in the chat as we go. These will be answered after the presentation. Uh, also, just a reminder that this webinar is being recorded. Okay, with that, I'd like to introduce our uh, speaker for today and get on with things. So Dr. Zeng is a carbon cycle scientist and modeler at the University of Maryland. He was chair of the Ninth International CO2 Conference and served on the U.S. Carbon Cycle Science Working Group. And he's also a contributing author of three IPCC reports. Um, he was also uh, this is something I was particularly interested in, co-author or one of the co-authors on the famous Friedlingstein paper, uh, Climate Carbon Cycle Feedback uh, Analysis. Uh, and this paper basically showed that 
the terrestrial biosphere and ecosystems could change from a moderate sink of carbon presently to a carbon source as the climate changes. A very um, uh, highly cited paper and really motivating of lots of um, carbon cycle research. I will say though that Ning is interested in not just sort of um, you know modeling and looking at, at, at what may happen, but basically actively working on solutions to the climate problem. And that's what we're here uh, to hear about today. Ning and his Wood Vault concept have made it to the in the top 60 teams for the $100 million X Prize in carbon removal. Uh, his work has also received high marks in articles um, in the MIT Technology Review and also Green Biz. Uh, we're very pleased to have with us today uh, Dr. Ning Zeng, and I welcome him, and uh, I welcome you all, and take it away, Ning. Thank you, Dave, uh, and thank USDA Northeast Climate Hub for inviting me, and it's a great pleasure to uh, talk to this audience about this idea that has evolved over more than 15 years of period and went through the valley of death, and uh, now um, several organizations and companies are doing research and trying to put this in practice. So it's at a critical moment that when the climate is also becoming really <laughs> dangerous or in a crisis. So I'm hoping this method offer a new avenue of looking at how we can combine the power of nature with uh, human engineering uh, intervention to really make a major dent in uh, helping to solve our climate change problem. So let me first give a summary of the main points I want to make about wood harvesting and storage. Basically, it proposes to collect sustainably sourced, unmerchantable residual woody biomass store in specially engineered structure called wood vault for secure carbon dioxide removal or CDR. And we are targeting a durability of 1000 plus years. And uh, our initial projects as well as economic analysis shows that when scaled up, it could be 10 to $50 per ton CO2. And it has very low capital investment uh, basically can be done by anybody immediately. And it's carbon efficient. Uh, more than 90% of the carbon will be stored compared to, for example, uh, biochar, where you have much smaller fraction of the carbon from the raw biomass is actually in storage. And the fossil fuel emissions in machine operation is less than 2% of the carbon sequestered. And it's distributed and highly scalable. And we think it's ready to deploy at megaton scale in the coming years and gigaton scale potential in the 2030s globally. In the US, our assessment suggests that it can offset all the greenhouse gas emissions from the ag sector. Um, so quick uh, a history of the method so the initial development is from 2006 to 2013, with a couple of papers, including the second paper from a scientific uh, consortium. And then two demo projects. One is a, actually a UMD student project, three years of um, burial experiment that demonstrated the basic methodology of wood burial, and then Importantly, the Montreal project that started in 2013 and is still ongoing, where 35 ton was buried under an anaerobic condition. And uh, I'm going to show a couple of uh, slides later about the results. And then carbon lockdown project was created to uh, help others as well as support real world uh, implement implementation of wood vault. Then several other organizations, for example, the Yale Carbon Containment Lab, um, InterEarth, Kodama, Tau Carbon, et cetera, are working on either the research or actual project implementation. 
So WHS, even though it's relatively novel, um, but actually has been evaluated by various authors. For example, the 2019 National Academy report says that WHS could be viable approaches to increase in carbon removal. The technology is simple and easily applied. And then a paper last year in particular uh, compared wood harvesting storage with a spectrum of other biomass utilization method concluded that wood burial is one of the best options of biomass utilization. And uh, at a carbon price higher than $150 per ton, this is like the most, um, the best option to utilize biomass. Basically what's, you know, what's called ENS principle, the carbon value uh, in the biomass at that current carbon price exceeds the energy uh, price you can get. So the scientific basis is this, the terrestrial carbon cycle each year picks up 220 gigaton CO2. That is six times larger than the annual fossil fuel emission in the net primary productivity. And of course, most of that goes back into them, sir, via decomposition and respiration. So the fast carbon cycle has very small a net impact on answer CO2. So the idea of um, wood vault really comes in to siphon off a part of this productivity and change its storage lifetime from year to decades to hundreds to thousands of years. So put it into a semi-permanent storage. So this effectively uses the biosphere as a carbon pump, and then the storage itself for permanent carbon sequestration. So this is equivalent to uh, growing a chicken for the eggs, not just for the chicken meat itself. And because the carbon cycles through very fast, if you don't store it, it just goes back. So there is an opportunity loss if we actually don't do something like this. So first, of course, is a sustainable wood sourcing and the terrestrial biosphere, the land is limited, the productive is limited. So there are two major methods. What we call type A is to utilize wood residuals, including the anticipated fire thinning in the West, as well as huge amount of urban waste wood, other things like a storm blow down, forestry residues. And the baseline counterfactual in many of these cases, like mulched in this case, or just burned, so very quickly goes back to the atmosphere. So you keep that there not to decompose. So this net gain is the carbon benefit from uh, elongating the uh, carbon storage time. So this alone we estimated could have a global potential of up to one to two gigaton CO2 per year. And then wood vault is a name for the engineering structure that actually stores the wood while wood harvesting storage is for this whole methodology. So the concept is actually really straightforward. And you take the residual wood and bring it down to a shallow geologic layer and uh, can be very shallow, could be like a couple of meters below, but typically a few meters. The key is to keep it below the active biological layer where you have a lot of organic activity, which is often one meter or so in most cases. So engineering wise, take it down to that level is not as challenging as take it down to one kilometer what we typically consider geological, but yet it's deep enough to maintain anaerobic condition. So to keep it from decomposing. And the land after you cap your pits can be repurposed for many purposes such as grazing, park, agrivotex, or recreation and so on. 
So the engineering itself, of course, it involves well-established practice, really uh, digging whole hole construction. And uh, of course, the goal of keeping anaerobic requires interdisciplinary uh, science to ensure it's done right. That is not trivial. And so here to help you to envision the size of this, we define what's called a wood vault unit. It occupies one hectare of land, 2.5 acres, with a 10 meter effective height. The wood volume we can put into that, air, that pit is 100,000 cubic meter. The carbon sequester is 0.1 megaton CO2 equivalent. Uh, in a area like the East Coast, we can, util we can get to that sustainably with one year of merchantable wood residuals from 2,500 kilometer area. That is about the size of two typical um, East Coast counties. So what does the actual operation look like? So this sequence came from the Montreal project. So the just one excavator or well, the wood pile was already there and accumulated from the previous season involving some local transportation. But the trench digging here, you see the trench is dug. You can see people standing here to get a sense of the size. This particular pit is 20 meter by eight meter and five meter deep. And then the wood material is laid down into the pit and then backfilled with the original topsoil filled at the very uh, last. So the whole operation here took only four hours in uh, March, 2013. And nine years later, the site looks like this. So we basically didn't do anything, just let natural process take place. You see uh, grass has grown on top and uh, it still look as beautiful as before. And one of the key scientific question is really under what condition we can make it durable to a thousand years or longer. Um, so here we have analyzed data over last year excavated. Um, I just want to point out just one picture here. This was a log that was re-excavated buried 1.2 meter below the surface. So we cut it open on site. You can see the cross section looks basically fresh and we could smell the sawdust just like a sawmill. And in comparison, this disc was left on the surface at the time of burial. So it looked like this. And then we can of course look at the data cellulose structure and so on. And that's consistent with the visual impression you can see here. And the extrapolation of the data basically tells us we can have a 97% uh, preservation after 100 years and 90% after 1,000 years uh, conservatively. And this is what's called a process flow diagram, shows the Montreal project. Um, the, this operation itself was $20, just the machine, the contractor cost, and 35 ton CO2 carbon footprint from machine operation, 2% of sequestered carbon. And um, the system boundary of human intervention or engineering is joined here. That leaves you know, the photosynthesis part outside, which is a key why nature-based method is powerful because for example, direct air capture, the engineer method, much of the cost and energy consumption comes from the capture part because CO2 is very low concentration. You know, you have to overcome entropy. That's a, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> so that's the expensive part. We take advantage of nature's power of doing that. And then the engineering part, comes to be um, you know, much more easy, much easier to handle and low cost. So in my mind, um, this method kind of hits a sweet spot of nature-based methods, 
versus engineering method. Definitely we need engineering. You can't expect this to go down there by itself. That would be fossil formation, which is much slower. So this is just um, um, common practice of a burial step, relatively low cost, well-established technology really can make this uh, work. So the um, summary of the major points I made is that wood burial is a first step of a fossilization process. So it's probably arguably the, a very natural way of reverse coal. And we think if it's done right, it can have a durability of a thousand plus years and it's distributed and highly scalable and low cost and low capital expenditure. And it's a closed system. So it's also relatively easy to monitor. And the land occupied by wood vault is small. It can be repurposed for different uses. And the environmental impact, there's some like soil you know, disturbance, but it, we think it can be kept at minimum, but we do need to do it very carefully. And there are multiple co-benefits such as waste utilization, fire risk reduction, mine remediation, park solar development, and extending carbon sink of reforestation. And um, sustainable wood sourcing is critical, uh, which sets an upper limit, uh, but we think there's a lot of potential. And it's already economically viable in the current uh, carbon market, you know, both from private sector as well as the government in, uh, incentives. And we think we can get to megaton scale in coming years and gigaton scale in the 2030s. Um, so finally, I want to uh, ask the question, how do we move forward? I've been saying all the great things. And in reality, there are a lot of challenges. And we think we know the science enough, and both in terms of the scientific literature, what we know from like archaeology, geology, civil engineering, um, you know, ecology, and so on. We know well enough to believe that this method has great potential, but there are major questions that need to be answered and we need to do it carefully. So I'm here in particular, want to promote, um, encourage to do a few demo projects to address the key questions, both scientific engineering and social economic. But I want to use this project that we are working on now called Potomac Project One in Maryland. So here we want to utilize the wood residuals that has been piled up at Camp Small, Baltimore, which collects basically all, all the urban waste wood on public property in the city of Baltimore. Um, they actually don't really know how to get rid of it. It's a great burden they worry about. And then the site is at a farm, north of Baltimore, occupies one acre of land, and it is not suitable for cropping because it's hydric soil. So our design is to dig trenches and lay down the wood uh, underground, and then the spoil will be reshaped into this curvilinear structures that has a co-benefit of soil erosion control and ecological enhancement. So because this is very local, depending a lot on you know, the wood availability and uh, the soil condition, so this we cannot have a simple model, McDonald's style, just spread around. It's really something that should be done by local people and based on local condition. So several projects like this under different conditions can answer important questions such as a durability question and um, potential benefits for the specific site. And another concern is in anaerobic condition, what if it has methane generation and nutrient loss and um, other possible negative impact. And then we need to understand how wood biomass availability is related to available, you know, suitable soil distribution. And I think the data and knowledge is out there, but needs to be put together specifically 
for uh, implementing Woodvault. And on bigger scale, we need to understand how this method, if implemented at a global scale, how it might impact the Earth system and carbon cycle, how it could contribute to a portfolio of climate mitigation and adaptation strategies. And then there are a bunch of social, economic, and policy questions, which we are actually facing, for example, with the Potomac project. Now we are going through the permitting process and um, current policy framework, because if it does, you know, this is something new, so it does not have something that you can really fit into, but there are these um, environmental and social issues that need to be taken into account. So how to um, allow something like this going forward and doing it the right way is a challenge uh, in many aspects I listed here, but I guess, you know, a lot of experts here, I'd love to hear what you think and what you can help in terms of um, uh, get uh, some demo projects going. And um, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Oh, fantastic. Um, thanks, Ning. Um, I encourage folks to, um, you know, type some questions into either the Q&A or, or the chat. It looks like maybe I'm not seeing them in the chat, but in the in the Q&A. Um, I do have uh, a couple of questions myself that have that have come up. Um, one, Ning, I think you you maybe just went over quickly, but how do you ensure that the the wood environment is an, anoxic? How do you you maintain those anaerobic conditions once you bury it? Right, that is in fact um, arguably the number one scientific question. Um, we have identified uh, low soil permeability to be um, the leading factor. And of course, there are different ways of burying it. So here I'm specific in the 2022 paper you mentioned, we presented seven versions of wood vault. Um, basically, the basic science is this. The decomposers need three things, oxygen, uh, suitable temperature, and, and moisture. So if you can cut up any of these three, any one of the three, you will succeed in um, keeping decomposers inactive. So for this specific, like this burial um, version, we are targeting at and are making anaerobic. So the soil, low soil permeability is what keeps the air or water from flowing through. At the initial barrier, of course, you know, there will be some air and oxygen in it but that will be very quickly consumed by a small amount of organic matter. So if it's sealed very tightly, and then no new oxygen can go in or small enough so that it does not significantly consume the organic matter in there, then that, that is, a, that is a, um, to me, that is like the leading um, a target we, we want to do. Then additionally, for example, water logging is known to um, you know, maintain anaerobic condition. You know, most of the fossil fuel coal in particular is forming wetland. That's because the relative anaerobic condition there. And of course, in the natural wetland process, a lot of the carbon does decompose. So in our case, we are actually engineering the wood vault. So we should be able to control better than the natural wetland so that most of the carbon actually uh, does not decompose. Okay, terrific. And so in, in the case in the Potomac site, it's a layer of clay that has this extremely low permeability that will keep the oxygen out. Right, right. So we need to characterize the soil, yeah, make sure it's uh, low enough. Okay. Um, I have a few questions coming in, um, sort of, uh, boy, there are actually quite a few. Um, let's see. Um, I'll, I'll start with um, uh, this one. Uh, in, in terms of forestry today, that loggers sometimes bury their slash to get it out of the way, um, but that tends to be smaller amounts of wood that aren't sort of thoroughly buried. Um, in another context, um, uh, the sort of this quest, this question, questioner says, 
It reminds them of the um, uh, permaculture method of huge culture mounds in which wood is buried uh, to make garden beds. And so the two questions are, um, is it as simple as making sure wood is sufficiently buried um, to achieve this durability in most cases and with clay soils? That's the first question. And then the second question, do you have a sense of what the smallest vault um, or wood load might be to offset em emissions used in trenching and burying the wood? Um, realizing that that might be a complicated question. So is it as simple as you say? And then kind of um, you, you presented on a, a kind of a, uh, a fairly large wood vault. Um, what's your thoughts on smaller ones? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And uh, in fact, as you said, I don't have a simple answer for that. Um, but it's extremely important. I know, you know, this is going to be a distributed approach. If I can do it in my backyard easily and that actually works. That would be fantastic. The, you know, um, landowners, you know, different places can do it. But I don't want to, you know, really get a, get ahead of science. That is actually what I think we need to do research on. Um, but based on the research we have done, under certain circumstances, I can actually give you a more definite answer. For example, the Montreal Project, if we, we because we have already characterized the sites there, if you um, are that farmer, you know, who owns that farm, you say, hey, I'm, I have another corner there, you know, I don't use, I can bury, I like to bury. It. Then I can come to tell you in that particular case, you just need to dig a hole. The size actually doesn't matter as long as it's economical for you and bury it below one and a half meter. I can guarantee you it's going to be at least several hundred years uh, lifetime, likely longer. So, so the characterization of the soil is important. If you happen to have the right soil, and then you are in good luck. But if not, for example, like you mentioned, the question mentioned examples like Hugo culture, I actually have um, uh, more than one person come to me can I do that? And unfortunately, in that case, it actually doesn't work. You know, it, Hugo culture has a typical, probably a decade or so that kind of time scale. Some might argue even decades are useful enough, but I guess I'm looking more from a, you know, long-term climate point of view. I'm a climate scientist. I know I would certainly strive for hundreds of years, not a few decades. Um, but maybe some modification of the current practice that would be useful. I envision, you know, like today's forestry practice, you hire a forester who can advise you. I think I see the opportunity of USDA or forest service to train um, like the forester, maybe wood vaulter or experts in the future that, you know, we have all these local experts who know the soil and the land and the trees around there. And as our science advance, advances, we can come back. So everybody will have this knowledge where it's suitable. And so I, you know, so this is a great question. I see this as a great potential to develop that knowledge base uh, where and how to do it. So the simple answer is yes, we can, I think we can do it at a very small scale and as well as very large scale. Okay, this is um, this is great. We've got a lot of questions now, so maybe if you could kind of go go for faster answers. Um, so, um, kind of a, a a question which is related to that, which is say a, a case of doing this on a town level to manage you know roadside tree cutting or tree tree waste um, de deposits. I mean, you did sort of uh, address that. Any other thoughts on on that issue? I think that's a near term great potential, like the Camp Small in Baltimore case. Let's not burn them. Let's collect them and uh, find a good place for the for their proper burial. OK, um, another question uh, has come in about, about the idea of using um, open mining pits uh, with the idea that maybe using a, a pit that's already there would would save on process greenhouse gas emissions. So the question is have you looked into the availability in areas of wood supply? 
That's a great question. And uh, I love to have some study. Can somebody connect me with uh, West Virginia or Western Maryland? <laughs> they, they, I actually did visit the West Maryland, the Garrett County. A lot of the mines, we, I think there's great potential. Like that's where actually the, the there are a lot of trees as well, high productivity. One challenge I can see is um, um, those are mountainous regions. So the transportation, you know, logging tracks going up and down might be <clears throat> challenging, probably start from the local, you know, uh, very close by sources. Okay, um, yeah, thanks for that. Here's, now here's another question that relates to the, um, uh, the, the process of digging the trench. And that is um, the question, do we know how much soil carbon is lost when the trench is dug? Oh, um, that is actually fairly small. If the, you know, the piles above ground open with wind blow through, even, you know, the rain comes down and so on, it's it's very small amount. Like, if, for example, the, the pile at Camp Small, the oldest part is like five to seven years old, but the carbon is still mostly there. So the, you know, we, we can afford to have, have it stay there for a little while. But it, but there is a loss, slow loss for sure. So that should be taken into account. Yeah, um, and and obviously, I, I guess that would be part of the additional research that's that's maybe needed just to quantify that soil carbon, you know, from the site. Um, sort of related to that, um, the question is: um, methane emissions were mentioned as a concern. Can you speak more about this? Have methane emissions at burial sites been measured before or after uh, burial? And in our own, you know, two projects, unfortunately, we did not. <laughs> we did not have the resources to do it. Um, but hopefully, you know, our plan was the Potomac project. We would like to do it. If you know anybody, especially close to Maryland, uh, who is interested in collaborating, you know, that would be great. Let me know. Um, so the... First, let me go to talk about just the science we know. Um, the notion the, of in potential methane generation mostly comes from landfill. However, landfill is not a good uh, analogy in this respect for wood vault because landfill methane comes mostly from food scraps, high nutrients. And then within landfill, the temperature is like 40 or 50 degrees C. Uh, it's perfect for bacteria. It's a you know it's a bioreactor. While wood vault is cold, it's clean natural vegetation. There's no high nutrient material. Another important thing is we say buried buried wood only, so woody biomass, not leaves, for two important reasons. One, um, it's nutrient poor, and two, it's more resistant to decomposition. So then come to wood itself, and um, bacteria, anaerobic bacteria, they don't eat lignin. So if we bury whole wood, like coarse woody material, um, cellulose, which bacteria do eat, it, cellulose is protected by lignin. You know, lignin is like glue wrap around cellulose. So we think, except for like, you know, sap or the cambium layer, you know, there's a plenty of uh, nutritious stuff. So that fraction, the main cell lignocellular structure in whole wood should be able to resist um, methane. So, so I'm kind of really imagining, I don't have data to support that. What will happen is, so a small fraction that is more easily decomposable material like sugar, in wood, if it's accessible, it's easily accessible to bacteria, will probably be eaten up and generate methane. But with a wood vault kind of condition, that process should be fairly slow because, you know, the just because of availability, how the surface area and so on. So it's a slow process now, but it still will generate some methane if that happens. Then it will migrate upward and then we have severe uh, these methane eating bacteria or methanotrophic bacteria. So at the soil above it, 
that will likely eat up this myth and flux coming out. And this should be a very slow process. And in natural soil and the trees, they produce methane anyway. So the critical scientific question I'd like to know is, if, if there is any leakage of that small amount of methane generated down there, would be uh, after eating up the top, come out to be significantly more than the background methane. So that would be like a scientific question. I would like to know the answer with you know demo projects. Right. Okay. Um, I think we'll move on, but I, I will point out that the um the technology of, of methane capture is quite well developed in the landfill community, and many landfills um capture greater than 90% of, of the methane that that is produced. So, you know, should there be a significant methane, I, I there may be technologies to, to deal. Um Here's uh, uh, somebody that has um, mentioned, or actually is commenting on the fact that you that more demonstration projects are are, are needed, and um, is uh, I guess willing to sort of connect you up with partners in uh, in West Virginia, um, and I think with uh, with the conservation districts there. So maybe uh, you can we can we can see if that goes forward. Um, Let's see, there's another, um, okay, here's a question about um, uh, biochar. Do you wanna, uh, if you wanna take a moment and just comment on wood vault compared to um, to um, biochar, which is a very, um, it's also an, an, another um, solution getting a lot of, uh, a lot of airplay these days. Yeah, um, I, I can pretend uh, to be a biochar expert, although, like more than 10 years ago, Johannes Lehmann and I did co convene uh, AGU session, um, you know, a uh, general carbon sequestration topic. Um, I guess one important difference is biochar has energy benefit if it's done, you know, in a, in a facility. Um, but the price for that was biochar, of course, so then you get less carbon. So I was told biochar the carbon efficiency is like 5% to 50%. So in most practical um, situations, probably on the lower side. So while wood vault, 90% or more of the carbon will be sequestered. So if the, so of course, wood vault has no direct energy value. So, so then I think it's a question of, um, the economics versus the carbon price and so on, how you you know balance that. And another, I guess, difference would be, of course, the cost. And um, you know, biochar, if you would do it with long durability, typically you want to do it in a centralized facility. So that involves handling transportation and then transport out back to spread over the farm and so on. While wood vault, is a simpler process. So the cost side, I think there's a there's probably also a significant difference. Of course, biochar has been practiced for quite some time. Wood vault is new. So we don't have um, more precise data to do a direct comparison, which I would love to see. But it, in long run, I see that there, there could be even some synergy. Like we talk about, hey, how about we fill the holes in between the logs uh, with biochar, <laughs> with biochar can be used for let's say the the finer material, which we think is less durable. We make the biochar, make it more durable. Ideas like that, and you know, we'd be happy to pursue. Uh, thanks for that, Ning. I think we have maybe one more question here, and then we can uh, wrap it up on a Friday afternoon. Uh, and this is maybe uh, just wanting a little bit more details on the, you know, the, the kind of process. And, and um, uh, this person has noted that most logging operations in the Northeast, they don't involve a, an, an excavator. Um, and so basically asks the question, does your analysis account for moving the large machine to and from the site or just um, the operating time of, of the excavator? Um, I think... I, I, I guess 
either move the excavator to the site where the wood is, or perhaps move the wood to the um, to the uh, you know more central pit location. So, do you want to just talk about the carbon emissions on on both of those scenarios? Yeah, yeah, it really depends on the scenario. Um, I think it's really a local um, optimization uh, question. Um, in the in the very large, you know, like the large facility in our poster child tumulus case, I think it more like a landfill operation. Um, so, like, for example the county can run a facility like that. Then all the waste wood in the urban area, today, you know, they are like delivered actually to a landfill or to a mulch facility. Then the county can say, hey, just come to deliver to our facility. And of course we will we'll calculate that emission as well, but the baseline already includes that transportation, right? So that's already there. And that could be quite efficient and then the other the other way would be to start from wood source, right? Then go around to find <laughs> sites close by, and which which is what we are doing now. Actually, we find the wood source, so camp small first, then try to find a, a close uh, uh, place. So, um, you know, I think when we get into practice, this this will become critical, important uh, question. You know, like right now with our Potomac project, the transport is actually the leading uh, process that emits CO2 as well as the cost. Um, and just a couple more questions, I guess, well, while we can real quickly, um, uh, have you thought about the idea of um, orchard recycling? So uh, I guess whole orchards are often when they age out, um, you know, they're they're pulled out and, and mulched um, using orchards as a, as a wood source. Uh, yeah, the yeah they have been telling me. I thought this was a very um, you know fascinating case. Yeah. Okay, the, and, yeah. and 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 another real quick question: um, Can the vault area be reforested, or would the tree roots potentially destroy the environment of the of the vault? What do you think about that? You mentioned pasture. Yeah, the depending on the burial depths. Um, I think in the like the couple meters kind of depths, I would, if you allow trees to grow back, I would say probably not trees with tap roots, you know, to certain species with shallow roots. And on the other hand, if you have very dense kind of clay as a cap, and uh, I don't know if tap roots can actually penetrate that, maybe they cannot. So I, I think we have experts who know the answers to those questions. All right. Well, um, thank you all. I think the uh, the questions are are sort of wound down, but um, uh, Ning is 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 really interested in in pushing this concept, um, you know, in in a number of different directions. So, um, if you have further questions or thoughts about um, you know participating, um, just please get in in touch with with Ning. Uh, I'm not sure if your email address was on the um, was on the beginning of the of the slides there. Uh, that would be fantastic. Or you could contact the uh, Northeast Climate Hub, and we can um, you know get you get you back in in touch. But at this point, I just like um, you all of you to join me in in thanking Dr. Zeng for a, a fantastic uh, webinar today and a really innovative concept that looks like it can be low cost and 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 highly scalable so um really really great news so so ning thank you for your time and and thank you all for um joining us today it's my pleasure thank you dave thank you everybody <laughs>